Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. And welcome to the Spring 23 Release Readiness Live Admin Preview. My name is Ella Marks. I'm on the Admin Relations team, a team that's dedicated to your success as an awesome admin. To help you be successful, we're breaking down the Spring 23 release and sharing some of the top features and highlights for admins. For today's show, we're streaming to you from all across the globe, and we want to connect with you and hear all of your questions. So here's how this broadcast is going to work. First, our experts will demo and share their features. At the end of the show, we'll take your questions live. So please take a note of your questions while you're watching all of these demos and presentations so we can get to them at the end of the broadcast. We'll be on Twitter and in the Trailblazer community monitoring for your questions. So please use the hashtag Salesforce Live when you post. We do ask that you post any longer questions in the Trailblazer community so we can work to get you a thorough response. Before we dive in, let's quickly visit our forward-looking statement. Please make any and all purchasing decisions based on what is currently available on the platform and not any forward-looking statements that I or any of our presenters may make today. Thank you. Today, we have a packed agenda. We'll cover flow enhancements, user access, Lightning Platform, Salesforce Mobile, and even more highlights for admins and users. So without further ado, let's spring into Spring 23. I'll see you all back here at the end of the broadcast for Q&A. Diana, I'll throw it to you to take us away and talk about all things flow. Thanks, Ella. Hi, Trailblazers. I'm Diana Jaffe. I'm one of the PMs on our flow team, and I'm here to tell you all about the latest and greatest in flow automation. Let's go. If you're a longtime subscriber to Release Readiness Live, you may have seen me on here before trying to persuade you to go with the flow. As we look to an increasingly automated and digital future, we believe that Flow is the tool best positioned to take your org into that future. This is why we are investing so heavily in Flow and why we have announced our intention to end of life process builder and workflow rules. We know disruption to your existing automation is always going to bring added challenges. And that is why we are communicating with you early and often about this plan to both give you time to plan your migration and to continually integrate your feedback about what you need from Salesforce to make this transition successful. With that in mind, I am so pleased to share that we have a long asked for update in the Spring 23 release. We have added support for Process Builder processes to our Migrate to Flow tool. So if you've ever been frustrated by that wonky Process Builder list view or struggled to debug something, and you haven't quite had the chance to go with the flow yet, then now is the perfect opportunity to start. Let's take a look at this in action. Here you'll see that my Migrate to Flow page contains both rules and processes. When I select a process, I get a new experience built explicitly for migrating Process Builder. One of the biggest pieces of feedback we receive about this tool when we originally released it is that admins wanted more flexibility to refactor their migration. That's why we did the additional work of displaying all the distinct criteria groups and letting you select one or more of them to migrate at a time. This will allow you to break down a big process into multiple flows if that's going to make more sense for your needs. So I actually have two options in this one screen. If I select a single row, like this first one here, and press Migrate, it will translate what was originally in the decision node of the process and transform it into an entry condition in Flow. This has performance benefits because you isolate a smaller piece of automation and only run the flow if it's true. We found from running the numbers that more than half of all processes that run don't actually ever take any action and this helps conserve those resources. However, there is something tricky about Process Builder, and that is that you can have interdependent criteria groups. So if you see here in my process, if one node says stop, then this criteria group below it will only execute if its own criteria is evaluated to true and if the previous criteria is evaluated to false as well. This makes it irresponsible to migrate these as two different flows without understanding the implication of separating them. So when we go back to my migration tool, 
you'll see that we've indicated whether or not a criteria group has Evaluate Next selected. Let's say I want to combine these three criteria groups into one flow because of that relationship. I can select all of them, press Migrate, and when I open up the flow, we can see that instead of using an entry condition, they have all been migrated as decision elements, and all that logic about how they are interconnected is preserved and carried over into the decisions. This gives you two options for migrating your processes depending on your business case. We even put a little info bubble here to let you know which action groups are definitely safe to migrate as individual flows. There may be others that warrant separation based on their business logic or other characteristics, but hopefully this tool can help you untangle a few of those as you work through the migration. Here's what the migration tool supports for Process Builder as of Spring 23. We don't support all the Process Builder actions, but after we ran the numbers, we found that these five counted for 99% of all the actions executed, so we felt like we were off to a pretty good start. For the things that aren't supported by the migration tool, I want to emphasize that these capabilities are supported functionally in Flow, so you can migrate them manually and we encourage you to do so. You should not wait for this tool to do everything, but it is our hope that by providing you with this functionality, we can reduce many of the hours of mechanical effort and keep as much of your time as possible focused on the things that we can't do for you, like your automation design, verification, and refactoring. So that was a sneak peek look at Process Builder Migration in Spring 23, but I don't want to spend my whole time slot on Release Readiness Live talking about what we're getting rid of because there is also so much awesome new stuff in Flow. Let's start by going back and checking out Flow Builder. Any good Flow Natic out there will tell you it's imperative that you write good, long descriptions when building your Flow so you remember what you built later on. But it was always a pain to have to go through and click every element one by one to read those descriptions. Well, not anymore. Now any element with a description field will show this small icon, and when you hover over it, you'll see the full description displayed. This lets you learn more about what your flow is doing all without leaving the canvas. Sometimes the littlest things can have the biggest impact. And I think this feature is a great example of just that. Some features don't appear in Flow Builder at all, but still have massive impact. I'm so excited to share that in the Spring 23 release, with Flow's version 57 or higher, we will no longer be enforcing the 2000 element limit. I suspect there's an admin or two out there at their desk cheering right now, so let us know if you are that admin. We've heard so many times that the 2000 element was too, well, limiting, and it didn't appropriately scale to the increasing scope of what admins need to use Flow for. So by making sure to fully implement other limits over the past several releases, we are now able to remove this limit in the spring release. But the fun definitely doesn't stop there. For those of you who just can't build enough screen flows, we have a lot of new features flowing in. With dynamic forms for flow, you can now drag and drop a lookup field onto your screen flow, and a lookup component will be automatically configured for that object. Not only that, but the component will allow your end users to create a new record instead of selecting one. If you tuned in to the last release readiness live, then I know you were excited to see the new out of the box data table component. We've added several new enhancements to it in the spring release and can announce that it's now officially generally available. The fun doesn't stop with Flow Builder, but we don't have time to cover it all here. Tune in to our very own Flow specific release readiness live session on Wednesday, January 25th to take a deeper dive into the features you just saw and to see a whole lot more. We have screen flows directly embedded into Slack just for starters. And for those of you who want to know where things are headed in the Flow universe, 
we'll have more product managers on hand to demo some really exciting betas that are available for you to test drive in the Spring 23 release. It's always a pleasure and an honor to share a sneak peek of what Flow has to offer. And I hope to see all of you back here on Wednesday, January 25th, to learn even more in our Flow Release Readiness Live session. I'm going to hand it off to Cheryl Feldman, who's back for her third Release Readiness Live. Thanks, Diana. Hi, I'm Cheryl Feldman. I'm the Product Manager for Authorization Experience. I cover a lot of the admin features that you know and love, such as profiles, permission sets, permission set groups, and the user access and permissions assistant app. I'm excited to share with you some really exciting updates to features that we mentioned to you in the last release readiness live for spring 23. In addition, I'm going to cover some updates to the end of life of permissions on profiles. Now let's jump into it. At Dreamforce, when we were in person for Release Readiness Live, I mentioned a new feature, user access policies. This feature is still in closed beta. However, we have made several enhancements for the spring release. You now have the ability to have 20 active user access policies to help you automatically assign entitlements like permission sets, licenses, groups, queues, and more when users are created or updated. In addition, we have also made user access policies available to the tooling API, the metadata API, and they are now available for both first generation and second generation packaging. User access policies is the feature you will use to help you migrate your permissions on profiles to permission sets and permission set groups. User access policies will solve several of your ideas on the idea exchange, totaling over 16,000 points. The good news is we are taking most customers into the closed beta that are on unlimited or enterprise editions. If you are interested, please use the link in the slide. I know many of you are so excited about the work on the field creation wizard to include permission sets. We heard your feedback and have made several enhancements for spring. You can now sort the label name and API name, and we added description columns. And we gave you a toggle to turn off the object access filter. So if you do have a requirement to assign field level security to a permission set without object access, you can do so quickly through this page. We plan to GA this in the next release. As promised, we are starting to give delegated admins some much needed love. In the spring release, I'm excited to announce that Delegated Admin is now available in the Tooling API. This means that now you can not only query Delegated Admin, but you can also insert and update Delegated Admin configurations through tools like the Data Loader. Now, let's talk about something that many of you have been waiting for, the announcement of the end of life of permissions on profiles. The announcement is coming soon, but the official end of life will be the spring 26 release. I know you probably have many questions, so please check out the resources on this slide, especially our Learn More blog post. Now, let's get into the demos. For the first demo, I want to dive into user access policies a bit. As a reminder, this is in closed beta. When you're in our closed beta, to find user access policies, type user access in the quick find. You'll see a setup tree item under the user section in setup. When we click on that setup tree item, we are brought to the user access policies page. If you take a look at this list view, you will see that we have three active user access policies. Let's click into the support rep active policy and I will explain what that means. Let's go through the different parts of a user access policy. The first part is the informational section, but there are two parts I want you to pay special attention to. The first one is the trigger type, which you can see I have set to create and update, meaning when a user is created or updated and the status is active. The next section is our criteria section. You can set your criteria to either entitlement-based or user attribute-based. From an entitlement standpoint, you can choose from profiles, roles, permission sets, permission set groups, and licenses. For this example, I've chosen profile. For the user attribute section, we support most standard and custom fields with the exception of date time, long text, and formula fields. For my user attributes, I've chosen that a user is active and that they have a job title of support rep. 
The last part I want to show you is actions. Here you can specify what you want to be applied to your user upon create or update. You can choose from permission sets, permission set groups, public groups, queues, permission set licenses, and manage package licenses. In this example, upon user creation or update, I'm assigning a queue, a permission set, a permission set group, and a public group. Now let's see this user access policy in action. I've already started the process of creating a user. I'm going to go ahead and enter the title of support rep and then scroll down and click save. Now you can see that the permission set was automatically assigned, the permission set group was automatically assigned, the public group was automatically assigned, and the queue was automatically assigned. There is another use case I want to walk through with user access policies, and that is around migrating your users from profiles to permission sets and permission set groups. Let's go ahead and create a user access policy we will use to migrate users in a profile to permission set groups. As a reminder, a user can have more than one permission set group. I've started this user access policy already. We're going to use this one to migrate our sales managers into two different permission set groups, one for the sales manager access and another for the report and dashboard admin access. Now you'll notice I left the trigger type blank and the status in design. Let's look at the criteria a bit more. We have the profile equals sales manager and the users are active. As far as actions, I have two permission set groups, but you can also revoke during this process. From an actions perspective, you can grant or revoke permission sets, permission set groups, permission set licenses, manage package licenses, groups, and queues. For the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to do these two and now click save. Now I'm going to click on preview users so I can see all of the users that meet the criteria of active and are assigned to the sales manager profile. On this screen, I can apply to all if I'm sure I want to assign everyone the actions I defined, or you can just apply to a few selected users. I'm just going to select three users for this demo, Andrew, Becky, and Danny, and then click on apply to selected users. Once the application is finished, you will see that everything was applied successfully to these users. And don't worry, we also logged these in the setup audit trail as well. I won't be able to demo everything today, but I wanted to make sure that you take a look at our learn more blog post with more details on the field creation wizard, as well as enhancements to delegated Asmin. This concludes my demos, but before I pass it on to the next presenter, I want to give you a quick roadmap view of what's coming for my product area. Just a quick reminder as to what we delivered in spring. I'm really excited about the summer and winter releases. We are giving even more love to delegated admin and improving the experience of permission sets. In addition, we are going to start delivering on the promise of more granular permissions. We will start the split of our first set of permissions. In summer, we plan to make user access policies in open beta, which means you'll be able to turn it on yourself. We'll also continue to improve the admin experience on record type assignments and permission sets. And further out, we'll continue delivering features to help streamline the end of life of permissions on profiles, as well as improve the admin experience and productivity. Now I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth, who's going to cover some really exciting updates for the Spring 23 release for Lightning Experience. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm Elizabeth, a Senior Product Manager for Lightning Platform. Today, I'm going to cover updates for dynamic forms, dynamic related lists, and dynamic actions that are coming in the Spring 23 release. Let's go ahead and dive in. To start off, I'm excited to announce that we're bringing dynamic forms to two additional standard objects, case and lead. We decided to prioritize these two objects based on feedback from our customers, MVPs, and the idea exchange where these two additional objects had captured over 36,000 points combined. In addition to bringing dynamic forms to these two additional standard objects, we have a sandbox pilot underway for dynamic forms and mobile devices. This will allow you to create dynamic layouts tailored specifically to the mobile environment. Let's jump into a demo. 
With the Dynamic Forms on Mobile Pilot, you can manage fields and field sections for the mobile form factor from directly within Lightning App Builder. You can set conditional visibility rules based on record data, such as the opportunity amount. You can set these rules for individual fields or for entire field sections. You can also set conditional visibility rules based on form factor. This will allow you to create tailored experiences for mobile devices. Finally, you can set fields to be read-only or required, right from Lightning App Builder. Now let's take a look at this in a mobile device once Dynamic Forms has been enabled. Because the information on this record has been limited to what the user needs to see at this specific point in time, it's easier for them to find what they need. When the user edits the page and updates the amount field, the page layout updates to show support package options, which are now relevant given the expanded scope. If they attempt to save without updating required fields, they won't be able to do so. Dynamic Forms allows you to ensure users only see what they need to, when they need to, and allows for a tailored mobile experience. If you're interested in getting a sneak peek of this functionality and having the ability to provide early feedback, you can express interest in joining the pilot at sfdc.co slash df on mobile. The next feature that I'm excited to announce is View All for Dynamic Related Lists. With View All for Dynamic Related Lists, users can see all of the records in a related list that meet specific criteria defined by their admin saving them time as they search for the right information. Let's jump into a demo. Currently, it may take your sales reps a lot of time to sort through all of their opportunities to find the right ones to follow up on. Let's edit this page in Lightning App Builder to see how dynamic related lists can help with this. Using dynamic related lists, you can filter related lists, ensuring your sales team sees only the most relevant information. For example, we could create a new dynamic related list that filters out all of the closed opportunities. Let's go ahead and give the new dynamic related list a descriptive name. Now your sales reps can quickly view the related list for open opportunities directly on the object home. This gives them time back in their day to focus on personalizing every customer interaction. They can also click View All on any dynamic related list to see all of the records within the filter criteria. In addition to View All, Quick Filters have two sections that show your teams how the admin filtered the related lists and another to create their own filters. In this case, your sales rep filters the opportunity name. And that's how you can use View All on dynamic related lists in Lightning App Builder to help your sales team find the right information fast. Finally, in the Spring 23 release, Dynamic Actions is going from beta to GA for all standard objects. The only exception is the Chatter Group object, which will still use the actions defined in the group page layout. Let's take a quick look at a demo of Dynamic Actions. On the Opportunity page, if we click on the Highlights panel, we will see that there is an Upgrade to Dynamic Actions dialog. When we upgrade, we're going to be able to migrate our actions from an existing page layout directly within Lightning App Builder. Now that we've upgraded, we can take advantage of dynamic visibility rules. As an example, we may only want to display the send survey action once an opportunity is closed. With the upgrade to dynamic actions, you now see new actions in the highlights panel as well. As examples, log a call new task and new event were previously only available in the Activities Composer. That concludes my demos, but before I pass it on to the next presenter, I wanted to give you a quick preview of what's coming next for Salesforce records, lists, and actions. In the Summer 23 release, we plan to bring Dynamic Forms on Mobile to a beta, as well as release table layout functionality for Dynamic Forms, which will allow for horizontal alignment. We also plan to release quick actions on related lists in beta. 
In the Winter 24 release, we plan to bring Dynamic Forms on mobile to GA, as well as release Dynamic Forms on 600 plus standard objects. We also plan to GA quick actions on related lists and dynamic actions on standard objects on mobile. In Spring 24 and beyond, we plan to close the remaining high priority feature parity gaps between page layouts and dynamic forms and bring spanning fields to a pilot. On the action side, we'll be releasing the dynamic actions bar for app pages, and our list team will release list views on LWC, which will allow for more seamless updates going forward, as well as performance improvements. Now I'm going to hand it over to Ron to give an update on all things mobile. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. My name is Ron Ledwich, and I'm the Senior Director of Product Management in charge of the Salesforce mobile app for iOS and Android. And I'm going to tell you what's new in our mobile release for Spring 23. So let's dive in. Our mobile team provides a broad spectrum of solutions for mobile. Every customer and business is different and may require a suite of tools from no-code to low-code to pro-code. The Salesforce mobile app over there on the left is our flagship mobile app, and it's what I think about constantly. The Salesforce mobile app is a central integrator of most of our mobile products. Not only is this app an end product for you to consume, itself is a consumer of many of Salesforce services and software development kits. And while many of our teams on various subclouds work independently of mobile, the app assembles these technologies and brings them to market in a single coherent experience. The Salesforce mobile app is available for both iOS and Android devices for both phone and tablets. We support the latest mobile operating systems, provide simulator and emulator builds to make rapid development easier, and update the app nearly every two weeks, as well as with major seasonal releases. And those are all automatically deployed by the digital app stores. It provides a seamless records experience with desktop, and we have a mobile philosophy deeply rooted in engineering excellence. This app supports millions of users every month across thousands of mobile devices. And as you may already know, the Salesforce platform upgrades three times a year with seasonal releases, spring, summer, and winter. The Salesforce mobile app coordinates with these major platform releases, but it also has its own rapid continuous improvement cycle, releasing app updates nearly every two weeks. And this means we can add features or address issues with speed. Now, we just finished building our Spring 23 release, and it's available in sandboxes today. So let's dive in. Now, keep in mind, there's an entire platform of updates, performance fixes, and parity fixes going on simultaneously from our various cloud teams. And you can't really see those as end user facing features. There's an absolute ton of plumbing to make all of this work. But I want to call your attention to the bottom three releases on screen. We're highlighting here enhancements that really improve the end user experience. Last year, we made generally available our support for tablets, including iPad and Android tablets. This makes the app universal, meaning it will run on any modern device, both phone and tablet, with any form factor size and resize appropriately. The Salesforce mobile app on tablet offers a variety of familiar features, lightning apps, design time previews, works across clouds, design time performance guidance, rotation support for both portrait and landscape, and this new experience supplants some of the older app experiences that we've had for a while. There are really two major groups of tablet devices that we support, but with variants on screen sizes. You have the iPad with an iPad Pro and iPad Air and Mini, and then you have the Samsung Galaxy tablet models. Now, the app will run on other Android tablet models, but these are the ones that we're officially testing on for performance and stability during our day-to-day -day tests. We've also updated Lightning App Builder to add Design Time Preview for Tablet, which you can select in the upper left during your record layouts. And we provide robust support for all of the out-of-the-box layout templates that you can see on the right-hand side. Now, if you tap on those layout templates, you'll be allowed to select from one of the 10 standard uh, layout templates. And we've built the Tablet App Experience to take advantage of the small form factor components that already exist for mobile and lay them out appropriately for the various device orientations on Tablet. Remember, tablets rotate a lot more often than phones between landscape and portrait. Now, we do this layout automatically, so you don't have to worry about various restructuring or layout code when the user rotates. You get all of this included with the Salesforce mobile app, and it just works out of the box. Next is another end user feature, mobile home. 
This is an out-of-the-box landing screen that's built natively for iOS and Android, and it's end-user personalizable. This allows your employees to pin their favorite reports, lists, and tasks and interact with them quickly. Enabling mobile home for all of your users is as simple as going into a lightning app setting and selecting the mobile home navigation item and adding it to the app definition. Tap save and your users will now see mobile home in the app as a tab that they can select. Another great feature that we've just integrated is enhanced reports. This feature completely replaces the web-based reports interface with an upgraded native reports viewer that's five times faster, supports both phone and tablet, and has mobile optimized filtering controls. This feature is so awesome that we're actually gonna default it on for everyone in spring 23 as part of its general availability. In spring 23, we're also making enhanced contacts available as an opt-in beta with a planned GA for summer 23. Enhanced Contacts is a totally redesigned, streamlined, and optimized contacts experience for mobile, and it is super awesome. We've rebuilt this from the ground up, introduced entirely native, redesigned contacts lists and detail screen. We've introduced swiping actions for calling and emailing at the top level. We've added caller ID for iOS and Android. Uh, we intelligently prime contacts down to your phone so that they're easy, uh, easily accessible uh, by the caller ID and easily accessible offline. We've built an automatic call logging to prompt our users to add notes after the call they've just made. Um, and this is also avail available on both phones and tablets simultaneously. So in spring 23, we promoted enhanced contacts from a pilot to a opt-in beta and added a whole slew of new features, uh, including the caller ID for both iOS and Android, which allows your phone to act as an address book without having to merge all of the contacts into your local address book. Next, we've made it simpler to do bulk exporting as well as importing. Um, it, so if you did want a handful of those contacts uh, synced to your phone, you can do that very easily. We're wiring up a business card scanner to make it super simple to import contacts just with the click of a camera button. And we've streamlined the import and the general user interface, making sorting easier and making the end-to-end -end flows a lot easier. As we go forward, here's what we're planning on building for the summer 23 release. Now this is under safe harbor and things are subject to change, but we're, work, we're still working on the uh, list priming. So uh, the contacts sync automatically without user interaction. We're working on the call logging prompts. We're adding additional uh, access to the swipe actions uh, you know, at the top level to allow global and dynamic actions to appear. And we're adding scoped searches, allowing you to quickly look up local contacts without having to hit the server. All of this is available on phones as well as tablets simultaneously. And here's an example of what it looks like on iPad and Android. As part of the Spring 23 release, we're also debuting a new mobile features opt-in panel to make it super simple for admins to opt in or out of new features in the app. For features like enhanced reports, enhanced contacts, and landscape support on phone, they will all be available here. This is as simple as tapping on the toggle, enabling, and then going and refreshing the app. And it's enabled for all of your users. Now, this is a pattern that we're looking to invest in in the future uh, to continue using for new features as we deploy them uh, in beta states as well as GA states. Next up, we're bringing dynamic forms to mobile, starting as a sandbox pilot this spring. You may have heard about this already from our other product managers who manage the platform experience. Now, as a reminder, this is a feature that allows admins to tailor the records experience by individually selecting fields on an object that they want to show on desktop or mobile and includes various logic checks against the fields or components. Um, and an admin can actually make selective choices at design time of what items to show or what fields to show. The way you activate this feature for mobile as an admin is inside of a particular record layout, you tap the Upgrade Now button in the upper right. Then you can access the fields inside of Lightning App Builder to drag and drop and tailor the experience. And after that, the desktop and mobile records experience will just work and reflect the changes immediately. This is one of our top customer asks and we're bringing it to market here shortly. Next, let's talk about what's new for your organization with Salesforce Mobile App Plus features. To help your organization, we are building a set of enhanced and premium features that make the mobile app experience even better. We've added built-in mobile application management, provided custom branding and publishing support, and we're building one of the top customer requests, mobile offline access. The Salesforce app is an enterprise app and it undergoes extensive scrutiny already, but we have heard more security requirements from our customers. 
With the adoption of BYOD models, we know that having users enroll in your MDM can be a heavy task and it can be expensive to support. But you and your security teams need the endpoint, the device, and the app to be secure and compliant to avoid any expensive data leaks or attacks. So we've been working hard to give you this additional security layer with features like jailbreak detection, enforcing minimum OS version, and device pin and biometric setup right within the same app that you're already using. The enhanced mobile security suite manifests to the end user as a set of warnings or blocking errors. The suite enforces security at the app level and can be configured in real time by a panel inside of Salesforce setup, allowing you to rapidly enforce new security policies across the entire fleet of devices. For your users, we can build you a copy of the Salesforce mobile app with your own branding and logo and distribute it on your App Store account. The app supports all of the great features that we've talked about, and we will keep giving you updates with all of the features that we have on our roadmap. So essentially, you're getting all of the things that we're building in a private labeled version that you can deploy either privately or publicly in the app stores. Next up is mobile offline. This has been a feature that's been requested by customers for years. Now, it requires a considerable amount of engineering to figure out how to sync records across the board without bringing all of the Salesforce cloud down to your device. So let's see what we've built in the app. Within the Salesforce mobile app, you can now select offline apps from the app launcher. These sit alongside your existing Lightning apps for easy switching between online and offline. We've built in secure data syncing that consistently syncs data to and from the device and provides record merging in conflict resolution. All of this is based on Lightning web components that you can configure using pro code. And you can configure the data that is synced to the device based on rules uh, set inside a briefcase builder so that you only sync the data that's relevant to your use case. There's a lot of technology packed into this app and we're building even more. This app serves your employees who are our end users, but it's highly customizable by you, the admin. And there's a lot more technology packed in this app than we even explored today. Custom notifications, deep linking, iOS widgets, and even more. There's more information on all of these features in our release notes. We have a lot of other features planned as well. We're working on making our login process more native, faster, and modernized. We're building a mobile onboarding screen to help surface features to end users in our upcoming releases. We're continuing to improve the fundamental experiences of the app by adding more tablet tailored screens to support uh, the various orientations and layouts, as well as adding landscape support to phone. We're also investing in our enhanced security suite and exploring enhancements like geofence-based app locking to lock the app to your physical location. Likewise, we've begun to dabble in making the app much more intelligent to help the end user with predictive navigation and pre-caching. We mentioned a number of pilots and betas available now. And if you wanna scan this QR code down below, you'll be directed to a form to sign up for the various features that you are interested in. For those that are private pilots or sandbox pilots, you'll need to provide your organization ID and then we can turn the feature on for you as product managers. There's also access to our Trailblazer community here where we post updates on the latest and greatest features that you've heard here. Thanks for listening to What's New in Mobile. Now, let me hand this off to Jen who will bring this home with some additional features for admins and users in our spring release. Thank you, Ron. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Lee, admin of Andalus. I have a lot of features to highlight for your users and for you awesome admins. We're going to start first with DevOps Center and Hyperforce Assistant, and then I'm going to do a rapid fire of the other Spring 23 features. So buckle up, you're in for a ride. Let's go. First up, let's talk about DevOps Center. With DevOps Center, users can use clicks to manage and deploy changes across their tests and production environments while using modern release management and DevOps best practices. Goodbye, chain sets. Hello, modern DevOps. You get a complete end-to-end -end experience. Users manage their changes with a work item. Think of this as a ticket or user story. The metadata associated with the change is tracked as part of the work item throughout the entire lifecycle. This gives the whole team a high degree of visibility into what changes are being made, their status, and where they are in the process. Let's check this out in a quick demo. In the DevOps Center project, we start with a work item where the change is defined. As we're making changes in the connected development environment, the changes are automatically tracked. And through a simple click of the Pull Changes button, these changes are automatically listed here in DevOps Center. 
No more manually tracking changed metadata components on sticky notes or in spreadsheets. Once I've selected the change components I want to move forward, I can easily commit these here. Behind the scenes, DevOps Center pushes these metadata components to the project's connected source control repository in GitHub. DevOps Center provides seamless integration with source control, allowing anyone to now take advantage of source control even if you've never used it before. This means that the entire team can operate against the same shared centralized source of truth. After I've committed the changes, DevOps Center guides me to create a review. And through the simple click, it creates a pull request in GitHub where others on my team can review my changes. And then after it's reviewed, it can be marked ready to promote, indicating that this work items changes are now ready to be promoted to the next stage of the pipeline. So let's take a look at the pipeline. This pipeline is configurable and has been set up to align to the team's release lifecycle structure. We can see the stages of our lifecycle from development through multiple phases of testing, and finally, production. We can also see where our various work items reside across the lifecycle. From here, we can see the work item we just approved. With a simple click, we can promote it to the next stage for testing. Upon promotion, DevOps Center orchestrates the branch management of the source in the underlying repository and the deployment to the associated org. Everything is kept in sync based on the underlying source of truth in the source control repository. Continue the process to move your work items and their associated changes through the entire pipeline to production. Additionally, we can see the history of everything that's happened in the project through the Activity History tab. Now, the whole team can easily manage and release changes and have visibility into the overall release process through DevOps Center. Next, Hyperforce Assistant. Hyperforce is Salesforce's next generation infrastructure architecture built for the public cloud. Salesforce is upgrading all of its customers and partners to Hyperforce as part of a multi-year roadmap. Hyperforce offers better scale, agility, security, and data residency. We're excited to announce Hyperforce Assistant will be available to all our awesome admins in the Spring 23 release in Limited GA. Admins are instrumental in ensuring a successful upgrade with minimal business disruption due to connectivity or integration issues. Let's check this out in a demo. If your org is eligible for a Hyperforce upgrade, you will see this in-app pop-up about the Hyperforce upgrade and an introduction to the Hyperforce Assistant product to help you through that journey. Go to the Assistant takes you to the Hyperforce Assistant page. Here, you will see four tiles to help you on your Hyperforce journey. Learn, prepare, upgrade, and manage. Upgrade and manage are coming soon. Start learning about Hyperforce with the Learn tile. This page talks about what is Hyperforce and links to a FAQ page. Here, you will learn about the main benefits of Hyperforce, data residency, scalability, security, privacy, and agility. Get your org ready for the upcoming upgrade. Click on the Start Preparing button and see the actions you need to take. You can run automated verification checks to find hard-coded instance references in your org. Check connectivity to your Salesforce instance on Hyperforce, enable enhanced domains, and allow the required domains and much more. Let's take the first action to remove hard-coded references. Allow access to Salesforce Optimizer, then click on the Verify button. The assistant will find and show you any hard-coded references in your Apex classes. And if there are any, like shown here, you can access knowledge articles, follow the steps to fix those references, and once done, re-verify. You can also verify the connectivity to your Salesforce instance on Hyperforce and enable enhanced domains. This tool guides you on when actions are required to get you ready for the upgrade. This release, we're really focused on increasing admin productivity. Two highly requested pick list field enhancements are now generally available. You requested this via the idea exchange, allowing us to deliver 14,000 points. No more managing pick list values one by one. You can manage deletions, activations, 
deactivations, and replacements of multiple pickless values at once. Additionally, we made it much easier for admins to manage inactive pickless values. Sometimes a mismapped data import can cause the creation of a large number of inactive pickless values, which can lead to performance issues in your org. Now you can remove all unused inactive pickless values with a single button click, keeping your Salesforce orgs in a healthy state. You've asked and we delivered. With this release, we're bringing two new changes to report subscriptions. We increase report subscriptions to 15 for unlimited edition customers. Please contact Salesforce support to increase it for all other editions. Admins can now report on subscriptions, see who subscribed to which report, at which time, and whether there are any conditions on the report. You can now also build more dynamic reports by referencing the current user in your report. We're bringing two new widget types to your Lightning dashboards, a rich text widget and an image widget. Filter your Lightning dashboards using up to five top-level filters. Create reports with ease. Select up to 20 Salesforce objects and fields to filter the report types. Last release, we showed you how you can see who has access to a record for 45 standard objects. Now, we provide more details on why a specific user can access a record. We'll show you the sharing rule name or whether a restriction rule blocked record access. If you make many account owner and account sharing rule changes, join the beta. Your sharing recalculations will finish faster. Use pronoun and gender identity fields on the lead, contact, or person account objects in Salesforce to increase customer data accuracy and drive inclusion with privacy and trust top of mind. While adding these fields are optional, gender identity and pronouns increase the quality of information on your customers. The more you understand the people you serve, the easier it is to provide standout service and make strategic marketing decisions. We're also publishing guidance for admins on how to ensure trust and privacy with the sensitive personal information. With each release, we're trying to make Guidance Center useful for admins to get guidance on how to set up your org. Salesforce recommends features we think you should set up based on what you've purchased and what you have and have not turned on, including some amazing service cloud automation features. We're removing the need to swivel between applications. Instead, Trailhead modules will open inside a side panel within Salesforce. With each release, you'll see more and more clouds covered in Guidance Center and shorter guidance sets that are more user-friendly. We're giving you even more transparency into your Salesforce contracts in this release with your account. We delivered one of our most requested features, the ability to find and download copies of contractual documents. You'll find completed order forms on the contract page in your account, view files online or download a copy, have all the documentations you need at your fingertips. In this release, you can complete a quote sent from your account executive right in your account app. With just a click from your email, you'll open a quote directly in your org in your account and sign or complete it. You can also see its status and know when it's been processed. Currently, customers are limited in the number of Salesforce orgs they can connect their Slack workspace to. This gets a little complicated, but let me explain. As you can see in the diagram, a single user app pair cannot currently be connected to more than one Salesforce org. A single user may connect to two Salesforce orgs only through different Slack apps. A single Slack app cannot connect to more than one org. This presents problems, especially for enterprise customers who may have many different orgs, for example, for different business lines, locations, or functions. It can seriously limit the ability to use Slack in workflows. Well, great news. In this release, we're providing multi-org support. Slack users and Slack apps can connect to multiple different Salesforce orgs in a number of different permutations as shown in the diagram. Have feedback or questions? Interact with our product managers and experts in the Trailblazer community using these short URLs. I'll wait a few seconds while you take a quick picture or screenshot of this. I hope you're all excited for these new features to hit your production org soon. Now, let's get on to the live Q&A. Back to you, Ella.
Thanks, Jen. Welcome everyone to our Spring 23 live Q&A for the admin preview. Now for the Q&A today, we are joined by an incredible group of product managers. We have Karen Fidelic, Ashley Sisti, Tion Kruger, Andrew Mangano, Manish Argawal, Kenneth Salko Shapiro, Nate Hosner, and the amazing folks you saw demo their products and features at the beginning of this broadcast. Now everyone is here to answer your questions and we can't wait to dive in. I've been following along on Twitter and in the Trailblazer community, and there is a lot of excitement out there about these features. And I think Squire said it best. We only get one birthday a year, but we get three admin preview lives. Love it. So we're ready to dive into your questions, but if you haven't posted your question yet, do not worry, there is still time. You can share your questions on Twitter or in the release readiness Trailblazer community using the hashtag Salesforce Live. We'll be monitoring in there for your questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our time together. So without further ado, let's spring into these spring 23 questions. Is everyone ready? See some nods. All right, let's go. Uh, Karen, I'm gonna start with you. And this first question came from Squire on today's developer preview broadcast. Um, and the question was, what does the DevOps Center roadmap look like to include additional source repositories? Can't wait to use it, but not with GitHub. Yeah, um, this is the most common, uh, probably the most common question we get, and it is the um, the biggest blocker right now for adoption. So we currently support out of the gate with the GA GitHub cloud based um, version control. The next one that we're planning to do is Bitbucket, um, and we're going to follow that up as the year goes on with GitLab, and also we're going to be looking at enterprise level um, Git based solutions. So we're going to try to just roll these out as the year goes on. Um, like I said, we recognize that this is the, the biggest blocker that we have right now. Uh, so uh, it's coming. Thank you, Karen. I know there was a lot of excitement about this. Um, is there a place people can go to learn more and kind of follow along with these updates? We have a publicly published roadmap um, that is available. There's a link to it from our Trailblazer community group page. So I think the best place to start is our Trailblazer community group. We've got all sorts of product information there, product documentation, links to blog, video demos, and a link to our public roadmap. Um, that roadmap is being uh, delivered via GitHub. We're using a GitHub um, issues repository to capture our roadmap items and track them as we progress them through lifecycle. So we're really encouraging people to take a look out there at what's coming and please give us feedback and comment directly on those items. So you can interact with that roadmap, tell us what's important to you, vote it up. We're using that uh, to help us prioritize. So please go check that out. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, the next question is for you, Diana. It's coming from Mark Jones on Twitter and Mark asks, he wants some clarity for folks who may have missed it in the beginning of today's broadcast. Uh, what is Salesforce's recommendation when it comes to migrated elements from process builder to flow, such as the my rule elements that get created by the migration? There's a lot of best practices if we're talking more generally. Um, we also have some sessions on automate this, uh, Jen's uh, webinar specifically on automation that I think on YouTube that go into that in a little more detail. I'm guessing because Mark said my rules, that he's talking about the fact that the API name will say my rule when you migrate a specific element over. Um, and one thing you may want to do uh, is rename your API names if you want them to have more um, kind of specific meaning, because right now they just get kind of a generic thing. Um, I will say, I think going forward in the future, we do want to de-emphasize API names in flow more generally. That's kind of a long-term goal we have, but we're not there today. So there are a lot of places where API names will show up first. And so it may be helpful to name those. I think that might be what Mark's talking about, but he can let us know um, if we wanna talk more generally about best practices. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, Mark. Yeah, please keep keep the questions coming um, and let us know. And we'll be sure to share out some helpful resources and follow up with you as well. Our next question um, is for you, Cheryl, and it's coming from the Trailblazer community. So the question is from Andy, and Andy asks, during the access security policy, is there a way to revoke everything, like a full, um, fully getting rid of the permission sets and permission set groups and licenses? 
Great question, Andy. Not today, but that is something we are considering for the future. Um, keep in mind, this is still a closed beta feature, but if you are interested in trying it, uh, please use that link um, that you can find in our Learn More blog post, or you can, I'll, I believe I also posted it in our Future of User Management Trailblazer community group. Um, we would love to have you, but that we don't have a full revoke, but that is something that we are considering for the future. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, Lori in the Trailblazer community asked for the link to register to the flow release readiness. Um, we'll make sure, Lori, to follow up. If you were able to add this broadcast uh, to your calendar on the Add to Calendar page, that's actually where you can find the uh, flow link as well. So make sure to check on Twitter and in the Trailblazer community for that link soon. The next question, Cheryl, back to you is from Squire. And Squire is saying user access policies are amazing. Time to kick the tires on our profiles and perm sets. That said, we use just-in-time provisioning as well as user record update flows through SSO. Will these access policies recalculate? I think I would need to understand more about how is just-in-time uh, provisioning works. However, um, we have tested with some just-in-time provisioning services and what happens is when those users are created and updated, the user access policy fires, if that's what you're asking. But if you're asking if the user access policy reconfigures based on your policy change within just in time, not yet, but that is something that we're thinking long term to build some partnerships with some of those providers. But um, Squire, reach out to me. I would love to talk to you more about that with some of my colleagues. Thanks so much, Cheryl. I'll actually keep you in the hot seat here for a minute because there are a lot sure. of questions sure. uh, <laughs> coming in for you. Awesome. The next question comes from Cloudy Mirage on Twitter. And the question is, will permission sets have better visibility into what permissions they have without having to open up each one to check? The answer is yes, that is something that we want to do. But when I look on the idea exchange, the idea for that only has like 2,900 points on it, which is actually pretty low, but it is the thing I hear most of you complain and give feedback about. Um, so if this is something I'm actually considering submitting this for prioritization, um, so it can really truly get on the roadmap. So if this is something that you really think we should prioritize sooner than later, please vote on that idea, please. Uh, because it has such low engagement now, it's hard for me to say, let me move this up in my roadmap. But it is something we do wanna tackle. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And I, I love that call out to check out those features on the idea exchange and make sure to upvote um, those things that are most important to you. I think I counted and we had over 200,000 points on features in just today's broadcast. So that is really something we're looking at. So if you're not doing that today, please, please make sure to go to the idea exchange. Um, Cheryl, I'll stick with you for one more question. Sure. Um, and that's from Stacy in the Trailblazer community. Stacy asks about profiles to permissions, spring 23 tab visibility, and wants to know if tab visibility will be moving from profiles to permission sets at some point, or where will that be managed? So you should be able to manage uh, tabs and permission sets today. It's when the, uh, within the object settings uh, section. If you're not seeing it there, please reach out to me because that sounds like we have some sort of bug. Um, I believe I also responded on the Trailblazer community, but you should see them there today. But eventually, yes, that will only be available on permission sets. What we'll say, just so, because I saw some other questions about this just quickly, it's really your one-to-one -one settings that will stay at the profile level. It's your permission or your many-to-many -many settings that will be only on permission sets and then can be assignable directly through that permission set or through permission set groups. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Elizabeth, I have a question for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Awesome. So Pavel asks, which standard objects currently support dynamic forms other than lead and case, and what does the roadmap look like? Absolutely. So today, dynamic forms are supported on account, contact, opportunity, in addition to lead and case and custom objects. As for our roadmap, in summer 23, we're hoping to release dynamic forms on mobile in a beta. So all of those objects that are supported today would then be supported on mobile as well. And then in the winter 24 release, we are looking to release dynamic forms on an additional 600 plus standard objects. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Nate, the next one is for you on view all for dynamic related lists. 
And this one comes from Kelly in the Trailblazer community. And Kelly's asking, I saw in the demo that we're getting a view all on dynamic related yet lists, yay. Um, but my preview sandbox has been migrated to spring 23 and it doesn't have that option on dynamic related lists yet. Any idea why? And can you confirm everyone will get it? Yeah, great question. We're on a different release cadence for this particular feature. Um, we're scheduled to roll out to all sandboxes on January 25th. So check your sandbox January 25th or January 26th to see the new view all feature. Thank you so much, Nate. Elizabeth, I'm going to come back to you uh, with the next question, and that is around spanning fields. Uh, Mark and Pavel both asked about spanning fields in uh, the twi on Twitter and in the Trailblazer community. Could you uh, share a little bit about what those are? Absolutely. So today, when you go and configure a record page, you can bring fields from that specific record onto the page, but you might also want to bring fields from related objects. So for example, if you are configuring a contact record, you might want to bring fields from the associated account onto the page. That's not something that you can do today, but that's something we are hoping to enable as part of our roadmap. One more question for you um, before we move to another topic. This one comes from Mark on Twitter, and Mark is asking, I didn't see multi-entity experiences on the list for future enhancements to the dynamic features being built. Has that been renamed, or is it no longer on the list of items prioritized? That's a great question. So we had initially kind of grouped um, multi-entity experiences and spanning fields, and when we dug into that uh, request and that ask from our customers, what we found is that the most important use case is being able to bring in fields from related records. So just like the example I just mentioned from the related account that's associated with a contact as an example, um, we're sort of differentiating internally. And I apologize, it's a little bit of minutia, but with multi-entity experiences, we're thinking about two records that may not have a relationship where you might want to show both the data from both of those records on the same page. So that is something that we are looking at as part of a roadmap as well. Um, but the customers that we've spoken with have voiced their opinion, have said that that's not as important as the use case where the records are related. And so that's what we'll be focusing on more in the near term. Thank you, Elizabeth. Ron, I have a few questions for you. So thank you for joining for your first admin preview. Uh, super excited to have you on. The first question for you, Ron, is from Pavel on Twitter. And the question is, did I understand correctly that incoming calls will search for contact name in Salesforce database? What needs to be enabled on the phone? Yeah, great question. So enhanced contact is a feature that we're actually putting into open beta with the spring 23 release. So anyone can actually opt into it. Uh, and it's built into uh, the apps themselves for both iOS and Android. And once uh, that's actually enabled on the admin side to adopt the new enhanced contacts, um, what we do when the phone, uh, you know, when the app starts the phone, um, we will actually begin to sync your most recently used contacts uh, automatically to the device's sandbox without intervention from you. Now, during the beta, this may require a tap on the most recently used list, and then we'll sync those down to the device. And what actually happens in this case is we built in uh, what's called a call kit extension on iOS, and, and the mobile operating system will then call into the app uh, when a phone call comes in and uses the cache credentials or cache contacts that, that are on the device and quickly provides a, a lookup. So those that contact information needs to be on the device for you know a you know a millisecond lookup. Uh, but the really cool feature about this is as we're building it out, uh, we're going to be doing all of the syncing for you automatically, so you don't even have to navigate to the contacts tab eventually. Um, and so you're going to get all the, uh, the the most recently used contacts and some uh, heuristics there that will sync additional contacts. So hopefully uh, you never have another unidentified call coming in. Uh, it's available for both uh, iOS and Android. Thanks, Ron, for sharing that answer and also for all of these features. Benjamin on Twitter uh, said there are a lot of updates being made to the Salesforce mobile app. Time to start thinking of a mobile first design strategy. Very exciting. So folks are really uh, excited yeah, to hear about this. Our next question for you, Ron, is coming from uh, the Trailblazer community, and it's around offline mobile for experience and community users. And the question is, will the offline capabilities work with experience cloud or community licenses? Uh, unfortunately not. The offline stack that we're actually building is going to be inside of 
the Salesforce mobile app, which requires a platform license and an additional actual Salesforce mobile app plus license. And so uh, we are, there is significant work on the back end to determine uh, which records that we need to sync and also doing, uh, you know, record merging and conflict resolution on the device. Um, all of that is actually really custom code on, on the app. Um, and that's just not available for the experience cloud. It's not currently planned. So it's really for the B2B use case uh, at this time. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, Karen, let's go back to you for our next question around DevOps Center. And the question from Laura is, will DevOps Center have retroactive history changes or only those after being enabled? So if we're talking about the changes that we're tracking in the development environment, those are coming from the sandbox that's being used for development. So those are going to, um, as far back as those go, is based on when that sandbox was created or refreshed with source tracking enabled. So, so that could be before DevOps Center was even part of the picture. So it's all based on the, the, the development environment and when source tracking was enabled and when that sandbox was correspondingly created or refreshed. Thanks, Karen. Ashley, let's jump over to you uh, around your account. I would love to hear, um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you a little bit. Can everyone use your account? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so at the uh, at the customer, at the org level, um, you need to have either sales, service, or platform licenses in order to have access to your account today. And then at the individual user level within the customer's org, you either need to have an admin profile or your admin needs to have granted you the managed billing permission so that you're able to go in and access all the features that are available in your account. Can you talk a little bit about um, the other things that you can do in your account? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, at a high level, you can see all of the details related to your Salesforce contracts. So you can see the start and end dates, whether or not they're set to auto renew all the products on that contract and all the orders that contributed to those products being on that contract. Um, you can also see invoices. Uh, you can download copies of invoices, which is a pretty highly requested um, activity a lot of the times from account executives or our billing team. Um, and you can also pay some invoices um, if they're under a certain dollar threshold. We've also added the ability to manage your um, upcoming renewals. So you can go in and validate that you want your renewal to happen as is or reach out to your renewal manager directly from your account to start a conversation. Um, and we've got some exciting new features as everyone saw today around order forms and signing in your account as well. And you can add licenses too, which is another one that we know is important. You can go in and add your sales or service cloud licenses and add some new products as well that you might not already have. Thanks, Ashley. One more question for you. How do I find your account? So your account is easily accessible for those who have access from the setup gear. Um, when you click on the setup gear, you'll actually see your account as an option and it'll open up the your account app. You can also access it um, from the app launcher as well. All right. Thank you everyone for posting all of your questions. Let's keep going with some questions on Twitter uh, for you, Cheryl. Are you ready? Well, I'm ready. The first question is, how will page layout assignments be managed once profiles are phased out? So I just want to make sure um, I'm clear on something. Profiles aren't going away. It's permissions on profiles. Um, so page layouts, we made a decision. So several folks on this uh, call, on the side on the product management side, have worked with me to make this decision that we're going to leave page layout assignment on the profile. Now, if there ends up being a use case where we need to consider that, but I think where uh, Nate and Elizabeth and the other folks working on all the app builder features are going with dynamic forms, that's where a lot of the focus is. So they will remain on the profile. I hope that answers the question. And I also posted that update on the Idea Exchange idea as well, so you can find that there as well. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, now, Paul asked around resources for the profile and permission set uh, migration. Is there somewhere that they can go to take a look at those? Yes. So um, the Learn More blog post we just released this week on permissions has a lot of great resources. Also, the future of user management. I'm also working uh, with a number of folks internally on creating an FAQ guide, as well as putting some more stuff on help and training. So it's it's coming where we know we need to provide a lot of best practices and documentation. What we have today is linked and available in the Learn More blog post that we came out with this week. 
Thank you so much for that, Cheryl. And I believe we actually also posted all of those links on Twitter. So Pavel, if you follow Salesforce admins, no I on Twitter, you can go check out a screenshot of the slide Cheryl shared earlier today that has all of those links that she just mentioned. Um, so you can check it out and keep learning. Right. So moving on to our next question, Ron, I'm going to jump back over to you with a question from Lisa in the Trailblazer community. And Lisa wants to know if we're interested in being part of the beta business card scan for mobile, how do we join? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, in the enhanced contacts feature, uh, we're going to be adding business card scanner in here uh, during the beta period. So if you want to, um, during the spring release, if you just simply go into Salesforce setup and then go into our mobile app section, there's actually a brand new features panel that we've made it super simple for you to opt into all the really cool features we're building on mobile. Uh, and the enhanced contacts is actually just a simple switch. You turn it on and all of the features that are that we talked about come baked into that. And so including the business card scanner. Now it's not available quite yet with day, you know, day zero readiness for spring 23, but we're going to be adding it in. Uh, over time here shortly. So you will get some of the features like caller ID, a few of those other export import, but as we're building it out, going from beta to a GA, we're gonna be adding more of that business card scanning in. But it is as simple as simply going in, opting in, turning it on, and then uh, it'll replace the contacts in the app and you get all those new flows uh, without doing very much, which is actually pretty awesome. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Elizabeth, this next one is for you around the app builder roadmap. And Mark wants to know, will we have the ability to add a blank field to the dynamic form section? Um, will we be able to remove the section label so that we can hide a section break, hide the transition from two columns to one column or vice versa? So the first question, we've actually put that up for prioritization. So if that's something you feel strongly about, I would encourage you to go and vote for that feature to be prioritized as part of the roadmap. Um, but we have received customer feedback on both of those items, and they're both items that we don't have a specific release slotted for yet, but they're gaps we're hoping to close over the, the upcoming releases. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now, the next one could be for you, maybe Nate or Ron, I'm not sure. So um, let me know who wants to jump in on dynamic related lists for mobile. And the question is, where can we go to see dynamic related lists for mobile to help our users see the data they need on the go? Yeah, so I'll start on that. That's a great question. We've had that request from uh, customers today. The dynamic related list component in the Lightning App Builder um, only supports desktop. Um, mobile is uh, an idea that we're considering for our roadmap, but we don't have any short-term plans to deliver on that. Right, Thanks, thank Nate. You. I'll add in quickly. Uh, the mobile app is actually uh, an amalgamation of all of the Salesforce, uh, you know, clouds and features. And so, while you know, my team and I build and run the app day to day, um, we rely on teams like Nate and Elizabeth team to build in features like dynamic forms. And so, uh, it's up to teams like Nate to kind of uh, choose when to adopt and how to adopt mobile. But we work very closely with them when they do. So uh, it's very much dependent on uh, Nate's team to kind of get that in. All right, uh, Diana, there are some Flownatics uh, in the audience that have some burning questions. Are you ready to answer? Absolutely, love to hear it. Awesome. So the first one is from Tamar on the Trailblazer community. And the question is, will Process Builder Migration Tool migrate the same record updates to a before save flow? It won't at this time. We did do that for workflow rules, but we found that a lot of Process Builder had things mixed in. And so um, we wanted, we knew there would sort of be, um, it would need to branch into multiple flows potentially if it was paired with a um, related record update or an email alert. And we didn't quite have the time and the logic to put all of that in. So um, it doesn't do that for Process Builder. It will do that for workflow rules where there's just a field update because those are pretty easy to migrate one to one. We do still absolutely recommend that you move those to before save. You can go into the start node and change from um, after save to before save if you need to. The main thing is that does affect the order of execution. And so usually that requires a little bit of additional testing. Um, so uh, we're trying to help you along, but regardless, you are going to need to probably do some additional testing. So that's probably the most important thing to keep in mind. Thanks, Diana. This next one is from Michael in the Trailblazer community, and he asks, when migrating all of our automations to flows, what is your advice when consolidating logic into a single flow versus leaving them all standalone? That's the million dollar question. I think um, 
I would say it's definitely worthwhile to combine like with like. So a lot of what we're looking at is how many different flows are executing and are they executing to do something versus do something redundant? Um, because you, if you don't set any entry conditions and you're triggering on every single change, you can end up doing a lot of repeat things where you're setting a field that's already been set um, or you're just consuming additional limits that you don't need to do. So I would say the number one thing to do is make sure you're using your entry conditions. It can be helpful to combine some things. So things like workflow rules, you have to split out every single rule. Like if um, a pick list equals status one, status two, status three, that's the kind of thing I think it makes sense to put into one flow, do an is changed on that field as an entry condition. And then you can use a decision element to kind of group it all together. Cause I think that can help with readability and long-term maintainability. So it really, um, it's going to depend a little bit on your business case, but um, trying to group things logically while making sure to um, also utilize those entry conditions. So you can have lots of flows, but um, ideally on an individual change, you have a minimal number of flows that are actually activated. That's kind of the ideal. So grouping by use case, grouping by affected fields are great ways to do that. Thank you, Diana. Now, as you said, this is a really big question. And yeah. Jen, I think you may have covered this recently uh, in an episode of our live stream series, Automate This. So for folks who may not know Automate This, could you uh, share a little bit about it and where they can tune in? So I've been a long time fanatic and love how I could build automation while code. So I created Automate This, which is a live stream series on our Salesforce admins YouTube channel. And what you'll find there is a playlist that shows all our uh, recorded Automate This um, sessions. And I do a live episode each month. And so what we do here is I feature trailblazers who solve real world business problems with automation, we talk about automation topics that are top of mind for admins, like record triggered flow design patterns, and we share different migration strategies for workflow rules and processes to flow. Uh, most recently, we did one a couple of days ago with Rebecca Glasser, who did an awesome job demoing live a workflow role to flow migration, um, and we had Diana on for questions. But the best part of this um, series is that you can interact live with people in the audience and ask questions of our presenters. So just a quick plug for our next episode, Wednesday, February 22nd at 1030 a.m. Pacific featuring use cases on uh, MuSoft Composer and Flow and a sneak peek into the MuSoft Composer roadmap. Jen, that sounds amazing. I cannot wait for February and I'm sure folks are super excited as well. So make sure to check that out. Diana, let's do one more question for you uh, from Tamar in the Trailblazer community. And Tamar is asking, can we get an easier way to search and find flows in list views, search this list or in setup search? That's a great idea. Um, would love to do it. I don't think it's super high on our list right now, but that's the kind of thing to put um, as a vote in the Trailblazer community. I'll also say um, you can set up some smart filters because um, the list view does support that, which um, doesn't always help, but can help you filter. And then you can use the page search if you have a small enough list. Um, and then we also have Trigger Explorer. So Flow Trigger Explorer, if you want to visualize specifically your record triggered flows, if you end up building a lot of them. So those are some ways we have. It's not searched directly. We also have um, your triggered flows in the object manager um, grouped by object. So uh, we're trying to chip away at the problem a little bit. I don't know that search is is at the top of the list, but uh, happy to get that feedback. And I'll just plus one, Jen, on the um, automate this. I will say I always learn a ton from watching them as well. Uh, a lot of what we're trying to do, we look at best practices maybe at a global or technical scale, but there's really nothing like real world admins to tell you kind of the nitty gritty on what works, what doesn't, what was super useful, um, especially on something like migration or how to structure things. A lot of that, there's an art to it as well as um, some of the math or science of it. So I think it's a really great place to get that experience uh, shared with you. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, Jen, also for that amazing uh, content series that you put together. I love tuning in every single month. We have one question on Salesforce uh, for Slack. Tian, the question is, what do multi-org connections in the Salesforce for Slack give us that we did not have today? 
Yeah, that's a great question, right? So um, if you are using Salesforce for Slack, the, uh, the integration for the platform to uh, do screen flows in Slack or approvals, it'll just automatically flow to people in Slack um, or any of the other amazing features that's in there like URL and furling. Um, today, the app when it's installed in your Slack workspace only allows you to connect to a single org. And that is actually uh, the number one thing we have people ask us as well. We have multiple orgs for various reasons, acquisitions or departments or regions, whatever it is. How could, can we connect that app to multiple orgs? And uh, that's exactly what the, the multi-org feature is all about. You can actually uh, connect that Slack app, the Salesforce for Slack app to multiple um, orgs at the same time. So if different users actually use different orgs, you can get URL unfurls, you can get approval, uh, routing, all those things all from multiple orgs all to a single app. Um, the same features coming to service and sales and some of our other integrations as well uh, later this year. So uh, if you have a complex enterprise environment and you use Slack and you use uh, the flows um, features that uh, we allow you to actually build some amazing things in Slack, uh, this will actually make it so it's even easier for you to roll it out to all your users. Thank you so much. Now we are coming close to the end of our Q&A here. So we're gonna try to get through as many questions as we can in the next few minutes. But if we don't get to your question on the broadcast today, we will follow up with you on Twitter or in the Trailblazer community. Um, so let's try and get through a few more. The next one is for you, Nate, um, and it's coming from Nina. Will there be any restrictions for dynamic related lists? Yeah, great question, Nina. <clears throat> I probably need to know a little more context to answer that. Certainly, um, we don't have 100% coverage and support for all of the entities inside of Salesforce. We're at about 75% as of this uh, spring release, but there are still some entities that you may want to um, connect with dynamic related lists that are not yet available, but we do have an ongoing um, roadmap to release more and more entities for um, integration with dynamic related lists. That's probably the number one thing along with um, mobile support, which I addressed earlier. Thank you, Nate. Next one uh, for you, Elizabeth. Can you push lightning record pages from one sandbox to the uh, to another sandbox? The lightning record page has dynamic forms enabled. That's a great question. I actually don't have the answer to that offhand, so we can follow up after the session. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, Cheryl, there's a lot of excitement and activity um, on Twitter and in the Trailblazer community. Um, so let's see if I can get through a few questions here. The first one is from Jim, and Jim is asking, um, can anyone find that idea for more visibility on components of a permission set? Jim wants to vote and promote it, but cannot find it. What I will do is I will share it. I will respond to your question on the Trailblazer community as soon as this call ends or this uh, Q, live Q and A, and um, everybody can go vote on it. But I think I'm going to try to submit it for prioritization. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Um, the next one is from Steve Mo, and it says the ability to create a permission set list view that displays permissions on multiple permission sets and inline edit, kind of like the profile list views, would be a huge help for admins. That is something that is in our longer term roadmap that we want to do. Um, it's just not short term, we want to essentially rebuild the entire permission set and permission set group list views and bring features like that. We just have to get through some of the other features. And I know Steve is a huge champion of the record type assignment page that we're working on. So we need to get through some of those and then we'll start making those enhancements. Um, we just have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work ahead of us. But um, what I'm trying to do is make sure our roadmap is public. So the on the architect's site, uh, when that when the next uh, round goes up of the roadmap, everything that I could possibly share, I put it on there. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And we'll do one final question for you. Will there be a way to report on permission sets so we can create dashboards on our permissions? So we have a, a lab, I'm sorry, not a labs app. It's a fully Salesforce managed app now called User Access and Permissions Assistant, where you can do some of that reporting. It doesn't allow you to dashboard. However, we are working on a solution that's more longer term. I should have some news to share about that when we come back next time for the next release right in this live. But it is something I have my eye on, something that I know we need to do. Um, we're just figuring out the best way to do it. Thank you so much, Cheryl. We'll all tune in for the summer release. All right, so that wraps up our questions for today, um, but you can continue learning about Spring 23 release features 
and learn more. So complete our admin and developer learn more trail mixes. And this is where you'll find blogs, videos, and trailhead modules where you can dive deeper into some of the release features that we've covered today. So complete one of these trail mixes by March 31st, and you can earn a special community badge and also enter for a chance to win prizes. So super exciting. Make sure to go to this link, sforce.co slash learn more, more like Roar, um, and check that out today. And with that, I would love to say a huge thank you to all of our product managers for joining us to answer your questions today. Um, thank you for building all of these amazing innovations on the platform. And thank you to everybody who's tuned in online. Um, we're really excited that you are excited about these new release features and getting ready to deliver these new innovations at your company. We cannot wait to see what you build with the Spring 23 release. So thanks again for joining us today, and we will catch you next time in the cloud. <laughs>